Welcome to The Method Podcast. I'm Aidan Simpson, and this is where we talk to designers at Google about work, life, and the future of design. What I love about being a researcher is like, you get this snapshot of someone's intimate life for just a, a fraction of a moment. You get to see kind of where their pain is, where their strife is, where their hopes are and their aspirations. Today, I'm talking with UX researcher Todd Hausman about the human side of research, taking career risks, and his work on Chrome OS. That's the operating system on devices like the Chromebook and Acer's new 10-inch tablet. So let's get started. So my name is Todd Hausman. I'm a user experience researcher at Google. Right now I work for the Chrome OS team. We sit inside uh, platform and ecosystems with Chrome and Android and a couple other products that I'm sure I'm forgetting off the top of my head. What's hard about working on Chrome OS? So I think Chrome OS is at a growth spurt. So I think it's kind of like with children, you get them to a certain phase and you feel like they're healthy, but they have to move on to that next phase. And that's definitely where we are right now. Chrome OS was launched with the dream is the browser could be everything you needed it to be, that the web could provide the interface to the world and every facet that you might need and hope. And I think we've done that exceptionally well. You know, we've built a computer that houses not just a browser, but apps you need and I think the challenge then has become for us is like, we are fast, we are cheap, we are secure, and people think of us as a cheap, fast, and secure browser. And so one of the challenges I have as a researcher is a lot of times even when I talk to people that have used Chromebooks or Chrome OS for a long time, they have a really hard time distinguishing Chrome itself, the browser, from the computer, the Chromebook, and then from like Docs and Drive. And so that experience is very continuous for them. And so they'll, we'll ask them what like, their top frustrations are about the hardware, and they'll start saying, like, well, I don't know if my dock is going to be available to me offline. That whole experience is the Chromebook experience. And so I think that's one of the things we're really thinking through is we have these kind of canonical or classic challenges we've faced, and then we have to have these, like, growth ideas we really need to work through. Is like, how do we answer the needs of the information worker? How do we answer the needs of, like, the everyday person who needs that favorite third device? And then what else could we be? And so I think that's the great challenge that a researcher loves is like, who else could we serve or what else could we be? So like in a perfect world, what do you think this could look like? Google's at this fascinating crossroads of machine learning where we're getting really, really good at predicting what you might want. And so I think in a perfect world, at least where we hope to get to, is where Drive itself or the file management system itself can predict what you'll need when. If we can get you to stop worrying about your own local storage or whether it's online and offline, that solves a major problem from both that blurring perspective, because now you know not to blame necessarily the computer, the Chromebook, nor Drive. We've worked together to create a solution where you don't have to worry about it at all. I want to change tack a little bit and dig back in time. As you mentioned, you've been at Google a, a little while these days. Is there a project that you're most proud of and has pushed you the furthest? When I first came to Google, um, I inherited this project called Seedling uh, that Molly Stevens had started. But what they really wanted to do is like take the ads and commerce team out into different markets so they could basically see how businesses of different sizes were trying to succeed on the internet and the challenges were they were facing. And so I got Brazil. It was this great exploration of getting people excited about going and going to the market and helping people kind of familiarize themselves with the segments we were going to visit. But then also having these very human conversations about like, oh, by the way, when you go to the bathroom, be mindful of. Yeah. And so it was this great kind of mix of really low and high conversations. But I think it was one of the, the first times like I got to deeply know the people that went out on the trip with me. We still, when we get together, share those experiences. And, it, and every once in a while, believe it or not, um, someone will come to me and be like, hey, we used one of the Project Seedling Insights to further this project. And so it's one of those kind of things that even though it was one like almost five years ago, it's one of the projects that still comes back again. Like I still remember a lot of the users I met. One of my favorite was we'd met this guy whose main business was making custom fish tanks. But he wanted desperately to be in the pet store business. He loved animals. He wanted to sell animals. But all of his profits came from making fish tanks. And so it was kind of this interesting conundrum for, like, how he aspirationally wanted to promote his business as, like, this like place to buy fish and, and puppies and kittens and lizards. But he knew that his bread and butter were these fish tanks. And so when he talked to us about, like, his advertising challenges, it was really an identity crisis. 
He's like, how do I promote what I want to be when I know I have to promote what makes me money that literally keeps the lights on? And so like that conversation, it cements what I love about being a researcher is like you get this snapshot of someone's intimate life for just a a fraction of a moment. You get to see kind of where their pain is, where their strife is, where their hopes are and their aspirations. It's nice how you touched on the people, not just the project itself, but it was the people who made the experience. That's something that often gets overlooked. I think that that's an important thing is, you know, as Googlers, you know, not only do we have to have a deep connection, I think, to the users that we're trying to focus on, you know, kind of borrow that tenet. But it's also you have to have a deep connection to the people you're trying to do that with. Because I think it's in that connection, that's what gets, gets you over the argument over priority. That's what gets you over the, you know, the critical piece of feedback you have to give that person about a design they're working on. Is that you've had that moment, or maybe you had a moment of fun, you know, over you know, a fresh fish and a bottle of wine. Um, maybe you got to celebrate someone's birthday unexpectedly. But it's those personal connections, those small social investments you make that I think get you through those harder times. Um, Because you will have those in a product development process. Like, it's a stressful thing. There's a lot of pressure. And I think it's, it's those moments that help you stay focused, but also help you stay connected. You touched on why you love research there, but you actually started out as a web designer. I did. What changed for you and, and why? So I was a young student in college, and I was just looking for a hobby because I was a psychology student. I thought ultimately I'd be a therapist of some flavor. I'd probably go work for the VA, as a lot of us did. And I took this class through the library of all places to code HTML pages. And so I got a job at the local paper coding web pages on Thursday and Friday mornings because they were weekly publications. So I coded the stories they'd written the week before or the night before for the weekly paper. And that led to another job where they were like, hey, you know, you can code. I'm like, well, I can do HTML. (laughs) And they're like, hey, would you like to move around and do the other newspapers? So basically I got hired by that newspaper company to move around to their papers all around the country to, like, code these websites. But at that time, like, no one knew really what it took. And so on any given day I was, you know, writing HTML code or I was writing database code or I was writing SQL code to get stuff in and out. And then eventually I had to pick up some graphics. But at the time, like graphics were very, because it was, you still on dial up, so you had to be really careful about the amount. But I, I dabbled in Photoshop, I was really bad at it. But I realized, it, you know, very early on that my favorite part of the process was figuring out what the people needed. And so that was like meeting with the stakeholders to understand their perspective, it was meeting with the people that would ultimately consume the media, it was looking at what they were doing once it was out in the world. So one of my favorite statistics that actually still holds true is that the most popular section, no matter what we promoted on the front page of a local paper, is always the obituaries. The obituaries outpace the classifieds, they outpace the sports page, they outpace the news, the weather. Like, that was the number one thing people would come to us. Because you could get a lot of that content other places. You get national news from CNN, you get the weather from weather.com. You were coming to the Journal News, which is in Hamilton, Ohio, for obituaries. And so, but it was that, that kind of insight that the team themselves didn't know. The state editors had no idea that that was the most popular section. And they only had one writer staff to it. So even the editor was kind of taken aback. And I think it was in that moment that it kind of gave me a, a giggle because it was like, you know, people are telling us what they want. We're just not listening. And so after the dot-com bust, you know, I went back to school to try and figure out what my life should be. And I decided that I was going to focus on those kind of moments. And so I started to study research because those were my favorite things. I also always admire designers. Um, this is a part of the design process I always hated was the very iterative nature of it. Oh, I'm on Mach 35. Like some people get <laughs> if real <you're> joy. <laughs> like, like, you know, I really thought through this problem, man. Uh, let me show you the 72 other variations I thought through. Like I never liked that as a designer. But what I did like was trying to come up with the original things that drove things forward or taking a step back and trying to figure out what people really wanted. Have you had a mentor or somebody who's influenced your work? I mean, the, the person I have to go back to in my own mind is oh, my first boss um, at the newspaper company's name was uh, John Kuzak. He would... Not the John Kuzak. No, not the. I, that would be sweet. He did wear a trench coat all the time. Um, no, he was just a guy from Cincinnati, Ohio. But he always would give me the same advice, which I have to go back to, is like, you know, do bold things. Because what's the worst thing that can happen? You get fired. He's like, and if you got this job, you don't think you can get another one? And so, like, that idea that, like... What often holds us back is the fear of discipline or the fear of retribution. I think that piece of feedback has driven a lot of my career is like, don't be afraid to try something and ask for forgiveness. Because I think it's a it's better to ask for forgiveness at that point than it was to apologize for never having done it. I think when I came to 
Yahoo for the first time, one of my first managers was a manager I had, again, just briefly at Google named John Boyd. And John Boyd really taught me the value of like doing your homework. One of the things he really valued was like understand the context that you're playing in, like read other people's work, read literature, understand the theories that are driving it. Because once you understand that, like creating an experiment to test it is easy. That's the easy part. He's like, but really do your homework. Does that flow into the people that you're working with as well? Do your homework around the people you're working with? One of the things that I enjoy is really kind of diving in, like what drives you? What drives Aiden to get up and do a podcast? What drives my manager to, you know, do the critical review is like understanding people's underlying motivations. I think is one of the things as a researcher I I strive on, but I think it's also one of the things you have to apply to your coworkers. What is driving them to do or say what they're trying to do? And then I think then the question becomes is like, is your job to, you know, fan that flow? Keep it going faster, you know, keep them in the zone. Is your job to, you know, block it just for a minute so maybe they can see the thing behind you or see the thing next to them? Or is your job just to get out of the way? And I think once you kind of understand those motivations, it's much easier to pick one of those three things to do. And there's probably other things that we don't have that I didn't talk about. But I think that's for me what I'm always trying to understand is like, what's the the cultural aspects? What's the product aspects? What's the goal this person is trying to achieve? And then your job is to figure out how to align to those things. What is your goal and how do you help align your goal to help them out, to drive them forward, or maybe slow them down, depending as the case may be. It ties nicely what you were saying before together. Go to the social situations, have a glass of wine with somebody, understand their context, get on good personal terms with them. So maybe it's a little bit easier to ask for forgiveness later on when you tread on their toes or, you know, do something that maybe they're not on board with. Very astute observation. I think that those, those three pieces of advice I often, I must tie together in my own head. So <laughs> it's like, get to know people and like build your social capital so you can't ask for forgiveness. But hopefully as you, when you do ask for forgiveness, you've at least thought ahead a little bit. You've managed designers and researchers along the way. What is an example of true leadership that you've experienced or something that's inspired you? I think one of the examples that I often go back to is I think one of the hardest parts of leadership, especially in an organization like this, is giving people truly honest feedback but giving it in a way that they can hear it. Because I, I think it, the people I admire the most are people who can give hard feedback in a way that doesn't feel hurtful, that doesn't feel cutting, and that's hard. But they give it in such a way that it feels true and it gives you something to grow on. And it's not about you. It's not about you. It's not to say you won't feel that gut punch. I mean, I've felt that gut punch numerous times, but I think the people I really admire like do that and deliver that really well. Um, and to those that I've had to deliver that gut punch to that are listening, I'm, I'm truly sorry. But I hope you grew, you grew from that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, two more. What are you not very good at? Oh, the, the podcast is way too short for me to get into that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right, just one thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think the thing I'm, I constantly struggle with is when I come up with something that I, I feel fundamentally that maybe I, I don't agree with yet. And I think what that kind of tells me is like, oh, that person is clearly wrong. And it's that moment that then I'm like, oh, wait, 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 wait. The psychologist in me has to kick in. It's like, are they truly wrong? Or are you just not seeing their perspective? And then I think the other thing that creeps in as human beings is like there's a lot of emotion in right and wrong. So people who are wrong, you want to dislike. And people who are right, you want to like. But I think the thing is a that I struggle with all the time is reminding myself is that human bias to hate what disagrees with you and to adore what agrees with you isn't enough itself a bias. And that the logical animal in me has to take the time to figure out like why that person believes what they do and that it's equally wrong of me to dislike that person or that, that request. And so the best piece of I got uh, actually recently was uh, from the superintendent here in Mountain View. His name is Ayende Rudolph. And he said, you know, Todd, behind every complaint is a request or portraying every disagreement is a request. Your job is to figure out what that request truly is. And so I think that is where I'm trying to grow right now is like when I disagree with a strategy, when I disagree with a direction, it's like, well, have I taken the time to understand why we're on that path? And like, why am I blocking it? Why am I in the way? Or why am I not aligning? And I think that's what I'm working on now. Last question. What are you most excited about? I think I'm most excited about where Alphabet as a company will be in the next 10 years. I think as a company, I'm excited that we're willing to take, you know, I think we call them other bets, 
But I think it allows us to kind of say, hey, you know, there's industries we're going to lose. That's just how this goes, right? But we're willing to kind of place bets in other places in hopes that one of those takes a deeper root. And I think what's fascinating is I have no idea which one of those are going to take root. In the same way, like if you would have described someone Google in the time they came out, I mean, it's not like they didn't come out to a crowded field. You know, there was the long dead Alta Vista Excite. There was Yahoo itself. And so it probably would have been laughable as, oh, there's another search engine that's coming in. And I think it's, it might be tempting then to say, oh, there's, you know, another car company. You know, now it's ironic that you have to say another self-driving car company. And I think when you see companies willing to take that many chances, that's when they grow out of what they were. That's how you get to be, you know, 3M, which was a mining company. They become, you know, a glue company. Um, that's how you end up like Toyota makes cars, but they started as a textile company. And I think that's it's those conversions that when you allow yourself to grow and be something that people need you to be, that's what I'm most excited about. And I have no idea what that's going to be. And there's an exhilaration to that. Awesome. Todd, thanks so much for your time. This has been great. Thanks, Aiden. Just a final word from us at Google Design. You can find more information on the things we talked about in the show notes at design.google forward slash podcasts. This episode was recorded and edited by Brian Gordon and produced by Barbara Eldridge. The artwork you see for each episode is created by Skip Hirsch and scheduling is handled by Becca Tolleson. Subscribe to the show on Google Play or Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like this episode, please leave a review. It really helps new listeners find the show. All right, that's it from us. 